So as Cam mentioned, uh, I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation at CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. And I've been working in the area of construction safety and health for, dare I say it, 25 years, yikes. And uh, for the next hour or so, I'm going to tell you about some research-based practical tools that I've been a part of developing uh, with other folks at CPWR and outside CPWR to help company owners, safety and health professionals, and others improve construction worker and job site safety and health. So I understand that not all of you work in the construction sector, sector excuse me, but I hope you'll be able to keep this Oscar Wilde quote in mind as we proceed. Talent borrows, but genius steals. And that you'll be able to imagine, even though you might not work in the construction sector, you'll be able to imagine how you can adapt the information and apply it to the work that you're doing in your own industry sector. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you him. Are you secretly a genius? Okay, so first I'm going to introduce you to CPWR, as Cam was saying, and the kinds of work we do, and why the acronym CPWR doesn't match our name anymore, which I'm sure you're all wondering about. Then I'm going to show you some practical methods, tools uh, that we've developed, always with input from stakeholders, and I know that's something you all do a lot of as well, which is fantastic, to assess and improve job site safety climate. And finally, I am going to tell you about the Foundations for Safety Leadership Training, which we've created to improve job site safety leadership, which, as you know, is a critical indicator of safety climate. I'm even going to share with you some um, preliminary and promising results from the evaluation we've been conducting over the last year. Okay, so my first question, who has heard of CPWR? Wow, not bad. Even sometimes that's more than I get in the States. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, for those who don't know who CPWR is, we are a nonprofit organization established in 1990 by North America's Building Trades Unions. Our funding, though, comes from three federal agencies, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Ten years ago, we changed our name from the Center to Protect Workers' Rights, CPWR, to the Center for Construction Research and Training because it does a much better job describing um, the mission which we have had for the last two and a half decades, which has been to provide service, training, and conduct research uh, projects to protect the safety and health of American construction workers. This has resulted in CPWR being known worldwide, really, as a leader in safety and health, and we're very proud of that. So let's talk a little bit about those three areas. I keep forgetting I've got that. Through a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy, we fund the Building Trades Medical Streaming Program, where we identify workers who have worked on DOE sites, um, and we, um, sorry, I thought she was coming up screen them for occupational illnesses that, uh, due to exposures they've had, and then we connect them with uh, the appropriate health care providers. Also, with funding from the National Institutes for Environmental Health Sciences, Sciences, we conduct environmental career worker training program to train underserved populations with the skills in construction and environmental health so they can have a sustainable career that they can then go out and use to provide both economic and physical uh, revitalization for their own communities. So that's the service. In terms of training, CPWR and NABTU, the North American Building Trades Unions, administer the largest safety and health training network with nearly 2,000 training centers and a $1.2 billion budget within the United States. Through this network, each year, hundreds of trainers and thousands of workers are um, trained in every trade 
in every corner of the United States receive that critical training that gives them the skills to reduce or eliminate hazards and exposures on the job site. In terms of research, so with funding from our cooperative agreement with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, a place where, as Camp mentioned, I used to work, we act as their construction center and we support university-based researchers and CPWR staff researchers, myself included, to work with our industry stakeholders to conduct projects investigating both existing and emerging hazards that are on the job site. While we definitely do publish our uh, research findings in the academic literature, in fact, uh, as an agency to date, we have over 250 peer-reviewed publications, but we know it's critically important that we work closely with our partners to translate those research findings into practical tools, products, and work practices that they in the industry can use to improve job site safety and health. We call this research to practice, or R2P. So using a number of guiding frameworks, including the knowledge transfer framework developed right here at the Institute for Work and Health, your very own, our R2P efforts focus on building capacity and infrastructure, as well as developing testing strategies, dissemination strategies, and translational products. To help our research consortium partners start thinking about planning their R2P activities from the beginning of their project, rather than waiting until the very end, we created this R2P roadmap. We know that um, this whole R2P effort and dissemination of findings doesn't come naturally to most, most researchers. I mean, they are there to publish their information in academic peer-reviewed papers, but we want to make sure it gets out into the industry stakeholders' hands, and we need their help doing this. And so we created this roadmap. We touch base with our researchers twice a year to see not just how their research is going, but also how their R2P activities are going, and if there's anything CPWR can do to assist them. And we also know, as I've said, stakeholders are key to getting our research findings and recommendations and evidence-informed tools into the hands of those who need it. So we've been developing partnerships with our stakeholders, particularly groups that represent smaller companies like masonry and roofing, because we, those are the hardest for us to reach, and I read in your recommendations in your report for the industry, you have the same problem we do. And so trying to get this information to smaller companies is a key. So over the past five years, we've been working on a variety of dissemination strategies because we know that folks use today use all different types of media to obtain the information that they want and need. First, we've developed a family of websites to provide easy access to our research findings and other information and tools on specific topics such as hand safety, nail gun safety, and silica safety. And that's been particularly important because of the new OSHA silica standard that was promulgated in March. We'll see whether it stays in place. But anyway, they can go to this tool and they can figure out based on their trade how to protect themselves from the exposure. And OSHA has also recommended it to the construction industry as a tool they can use to help them do this. Now, for those of you, probably most of you know who OSHA is or what OSHA is, but just in case, it is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the US, and it's an agency within the US Department of Labor responsible for protecting the safety and health of the American workforce while they're at work. So that's what OSHA is. <clears throat> we also use social media outlet, outlets, e-news, YouTube channel, and monthly webinars to rapidly disseminate information on the latest research findings, new products, other information that we have, safety and health events. So we try to, as I was saying, attack it in multiple ways. And we're also developing 
maybe we're getting, we're late to the party here, I'm not sure, but we're developing a number of cool health and safety apps. So uh, stay tuned for that next year. And of course, we also use more traditional methods like videos, infographics, and other print media to get our research-based information out into the industry. So that's CPWR, a real brief snapshot of, of what we do and what we try to influence. And I hope you have the opportunity to visit our website, um, which is right there, to find any information and materials you can use in your construction industry or in other industry sectors. And I think I forgot to mention, you won't be surprised, all the information is available for free, which makes your being a genius even easier. <laughs> OK, so let's move on to the next topic, Safe topics, safety climate, and safety culture. Back in 2012, a colleague and I reviewed both the scholarly and trade literatures and learned that over the past 25 years, there's been a proliferation of articles written about safety and health, uh, safety climate and safety culture, particularly in these air industries, because they've been looking for techniques over and above engineering controls to reduce the occurrence of these types of catastrophic events. We were surprised to find that less had been written about these topics in construction, even though the fatality data, the injury data, and these pictures clearly show that construction is a high-risk industry. We also came to understand that there was a lack of agreement on whether safety climate and safety culture were the same or different things. Uh, whether or not, uh, or how best to measure those constructs, and most importantly, what can we do to improve and strengthen them. So in 2013, we invited 70 stakeholders from the industry, academia, insurance, consultants, and government to attend a day and a half long workshop on safety, culture, and climate to see if we could come to some agreement on those issues. And here's the report uh, that's available at our website. So first we worked on the definitions. The full definitions are in the report, but this will give you a, a good sense of kind of the crux of it. Safety culture, it basically the unspoken espoused safety-related beliefs, attitudes, and values that interact with an organization's systems, peoples, and practices to establish norms about how safety is done in that organization. Safety climate, on the other hand, is employees' perceptions of the consistency between those espoused beliefs, attitudes, and values that the company says or writes about and the, uh, what's actually done out in practice on the job site. So that's where they see the difference between the two. Now, for those of you who work in the construction industry, you know that construction is different than a you know, standing company that because multiple safety climates come together on the job site. And it's influenced by many local conditions, including project owners, project managers, weather, all sorts of things. Workshop attendees also concluded that compared to safety culture, safety climate would likely be more amenable to change. So that's where we've been focusing our efforts on the, and I'll tell you about some of the products we've been working on to help companies do that. Okay, so after agreeing on these definitions, we then discussed what they thought the critical leading indicators were of safety climate, and how can they be measured and improved. So uh, you're probably all aware of this terminology from your own work, but focusing on leading indicators helps us be proactive and think about ways to prevent adverse outcomes rather than being reactive after the fact, trying to fix things after we learn about these lagging indicators such as 
injuries, illnesses, and even workers' comp claims. So before continuing, again, I want to give the Institute a shout out for all the good leading indicator work they've been doing over the years. So it's all good. We're all working together in different areas. So after additional small group work, the attendees at the workshop agreed that these were the eight key leading indicators of a positive and strong job site safety climate in construction. Now, they aren't necessarily in rank order. However, uh, listing demonstrating management com commitment first was intentional, because without that, the others aren't going to work. So how management demonstrates commitment uh, to safety is critical, as I said, for the other leading indicators. And it's demonstrated by making sure safety-related resources are needed, by analyzing policies and procedures and looking at data and looking at trends and making changes uh, for continuous improvement. Also, leaders need to lead by example and be visible and walk the talk on the job site, like wearing personal protective equipment. Doing these types of things make it possible to establish and maintain the trust of everybody in the company, which leads to a positive job site safety climate, an exemplary safety climate, we like to call it. Aligning and integrating safety as value means that safety needs to be woven into every, into the fabric uh, of the organization and aligned with other values and um, priorities, such as productivity. There needs to be a system of safety accountability for everyone, including workers, managers, supervisors, and even project owners. And incentives, we all talk about incentives, incentives should promote processes rather than outcomes, like how many injuries. Um, did you not have, because we know that can lead to underreporting. And maybe even instead of outcomes, so identifying hazards, identifying risks. Our stakeholders told us at the workshop and since that this is one of the most critical leading indicators. And as Cam said, it's one of the emphasis areas in the construction uh, recommendations. And in a few minutes, I'll be telling you about uh, a project we've been working on to address this. A strong positive safety culture, as I said, is based on mutual trust. To achieve this, employees need to be involved in safety-related planning, safety-related decision-making, and be empowered to speak up when they see a problem on the job site, and maybe even shut down the job site uh, if, work, you know, if they deem it necessary. And that may be part of the rules in Canada, but it's frowned upon in the United States. <laughs> Effective communication, which is the next one, underlies all of the indicators. And it's funny, last night I was thinking about these indicators, the lagging and leading and stuff, and communication. This is, I mean, this isn't just for work. All this stuff relates to life, our personal lives too, if you really think about it prevention-oriented, waiting for things, not waiting for things to happen, accountability, involving, anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting thing I was thinking about while I wasn't sleeping. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so obviously improving communication, you can do it formally and informally, and it's a big part of the FSL, which I'll tell you about. Training, of course, is important and you know people have been doing training for a long time but what we like to think about this one is not just focusing on the as we say sharp end of the stick not just on worker training but other training too training for managers about safety so everybody gets on the same page the eighth and last indicator uh, not easy, right, to get owners and clients involved in thinking about safety, but by doing so, you have a greater chance of working on um, changes, more upstream changes, or thinking about prevention through design and how to use that uh, when you're designing a building. So getting everybody involved in thinking about safety. Okay, so those are the eight leading indicators. 
stakeholders who attended the workshop said, that was great, really enjoyed it, learned a lot, develop a practical tool we can use based on the findings. Well, that was good, right? Because So that means they're engaged and they want uh, something that they can actually use on the job site. They don't want to just walk away from it and say, well, that was a fun day and a half or whatever. So um, we listened. And in 2004, we created a workbook. And uh, then we've updated it. And here's what a new one looks like. This is the second edition that we published in August 2016 called work, uh, Worksheets and a Rating Tool to Strengthen Your Job Site Safety Climate. The reason I brought a copy of it, because you can all download it from the website, and I'll give you the address, but if you want hard copies, we do have them, and you can request them. And I just think, I don't know, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but holding something that's bound and kind of printed nicely gives it a little more oomph than downloading, it, downloading a PDF, often in black and white. So I just want to show it to you as a model. Exhibit A. You know what? I need to take a drink of water. It's very dry up here in Canada. <laughs> I was amazed at how dry my hair got, how quick it is. It's like, wow. You know, down in Cincinnati, we're on the Ohio River, and it's pretty darn humid. I grew up in Michigan. That's why I love Canada. Um, spent a lot of time in Windsor, but I down in Cincinnati, it's humid, it bites through you. Here, you know, it's dry, it's cold, it's, you're done with it. It's really good. Anyway, all right, so here's the workbook. For each of the indicators that we just went over, there's a worksheet, and I didn't bring copies of this because I didn't know how many, so I can leave it up the table and during the, um, you know, hors d'oeuvres, whatever, we can take turns looking at it. Hopefully you won't steal it. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to, anyway. So on each worksheet, there are three different things. Because I didn't want this workbook to be static and just sit on the shelf. I wanted to try to think of ways that you could engage with the workshop. So the first thing is these high level rubrics, rubric based scales. And a company can go through this uh, rubric, again, one for each of the indicators, and get a level, a, a sense, kind of a gestalt more than uh, a specific measurement, for where their company falls in terms of safety climate maturity on the rubric scale. And uh, from the left side of the scale, which in the workshop, in the workbook is inattentive to the far right, which is exemplary. As I said, we had a lot of stakeholder feedback from first edition to second edition. One of the pieces of feedback we got, so on the far left end of the scale when we published the first edition, was dysfunctional. Our stakeholders didn't like that. So we changed it to inattentive, and they liked that more. <laughs> but then they can, after they get kind of a sense, you can uh, review a list of ideas. It goes on, each one is front and back a list of ideas and intervention they can use to improve this indicator, and then a prioritization activity that they can uh, prioritize by when they might be able to implement the intervention, uh, short term, medium term, or long term, and or if you say that you're already doing it, we say congratulations. Okay, so again, stakeholder input. Love the high level rubrics. Can you make us something that we can use, still using the rubrics, like the rubrics, something we can use to get a more detailed assessment of our safety climate maturity across the indicators? So we created what we call the SCAT. Well, to that end, um, Dr. Tahira Probst from uh, Washington State University and I developed the SCAT. We've got to make sure we keep that hyphen in there. So far, everybody is pretty much, still haven't heard it without the hyphen, so we're happy about that. Um, to create the SCAT, we reviewed all those high-level rubrics. We deconstructed it, all of them, into 36 different activities anywhere from three to six for each of the indicators. And then for each activity, 
we created a separate, so here are the indicator specific activities, and here are the rubric scales for each of the activities, okay? So let me just show you an example. Demonstrating management commitment. The first activity, and I actually talked about this a little bit before, being present and visible on the job site. Okay, so they go down to the first activity. It says, in my company, management rarely comes to the job site. So that would be an inattentive company. On the other end, an exemplary company frequently visits the job site and seeks out interactions with workers. And so we go all the way along, giving people the ability to do a much more detailed assessment, not your typical agree to disagree type of scale, which we often get with safety climate scale. But the reason we went the rubric route is because it gives people more actionable idea of what they can do to move up the scale. So that's why we did that. Um, to increase the availability and the accessibility of the SCAT to uh, the stakeholders, we created the SCAT website last year. On it, visitors can learn about safety climate, they can get ideas for how to improve safety climate for each indicator, and most importantly, take the SCAT. When you take the SCAT as an individual, you get a report. We also do companies, and I actually did this for the IHSA that we're doing tomorrow. We invited everybody, we gave them the link to go onto the website and complete the SCAT. I prepared a group report, and we're gonna go over that tomorrow during the meeting. And so that gives people a sense, not just of where they are, but also benchmarked against the data that are currently in the SCAT. To date, we have over 1,400 responses in our SCAT database. About a little over half come from the construction sector, but the other half come from other sectors. Geniuses, right? So that's very exciting. And, um, but for the benchmarking data, we only use the construction sector data. Anyway, DOE used it. They contacted us in the spring. This is a contractor for DOE. They had us do, um, we give a special code, 24 different departments. We did reports for each of those departments and they're now currently working on interventions to improve the scores on those low scoring indicators. And in the spring, they're gonna retake the SCAT to see if and how, by how much uh, their score improved. So we're really excited about that. Um, okay, so that's our safety climate work. Remember, I only had 45 minutes to do all this, <laughs> and I get excited about it because I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing, um, and I look forward to talking to you about it afterwards. So let's go back to the eight leading indicators and look at number four, improving supervisory leadership. So in addition to this information that we got from the um, workshop, these indicators, this number four, we also conducted a survey of contractors in 2012 and in 2015. And they told us that when they promote their workers to the position of foreman, they send them to the OSHA 30 hour course, which is a hazard awareness course, in order to learn leadership skills. We well, may not be surprised to hear this, but they don't have any leadership skills training in the OSHA 30 hour course. Like I said, it's a hazard awareness course. It's so they learn more, go in deeper about the hazards, you know, the fatal floor and all that other stuff. So the problem, as I said, the problem is it doesn't cover leadership skills until now. And I'm gonna tell you about this. So as part, as our, part of our five-year cooperative agreement with NIOSH, as I said, I'm funded under that umbrella, we received funding to develop and evaluate a training module designed to give foremen and other lead workers the leadership skills they can use on the job site to improve safety climate and safety outcomes. We wanted the final product to be such that 
Both large and small companies could use it. Trade unions could use it and incorporate it into their ongoing foreman training. But our real primary objective was to get OSHA to incorporate it into the OSHA 30-hour course. And that's my team, by the way, Stephanie and Natalie. In order to uh, achieve this rather ambitious goal to get OSHA to actually do something different that they haven't always done, um, it was interesting. But anyway, we put together this 17-member Curriculum Development Team, or CDT. We were very strategic about who we put on the team, mostly OSHA 30-hour trainers, because while the foreman is our target audience for the information, if the OSHA 30-hour trainers don't teach it, they don't get it. So if they didn't like it, they weren't going to use it. So we had mostly OSHA 30-hour, 10-hour, and 30-hour trainers on there. But we also had safety and health professionals from, or directors from large and small companies, union and non-union. Had a few academics sprinkled through, but really didn't care what they said. And, and representatives from OSHA. So we worked together for a year and a half putting this together. And the final product is a two and a half hour training module that we call the Foundations for Safety Leadership, or FSL. So in terms of structure and content of the FSL, the first third, again, we, were, we had to pay attention to the OSHA guidelines of how they create curriculum. And they have pretty strict guidelines, so we needed to divide it into thirds and anyway. And most of it needed to be applied as opposed to just speaking and didactic stuff. So uh, the first third does cover foundational information about what it means to be a safety leader. The costs of ineffective leadership, that was the other thing our CDT told us. You don't want to just say do it, do it, do it. You want to tell people why to do it. So the benefits of effective leadership, uh, the definition of a safety leader, which I'm going to share with you, how safety leaders improve safety climate and safety outcome, and the five leadership skills, which I'm going to share in a minute. The second part of the course, the big chunk of the course, are the seven real-world scenarios. We're actually working on three new ones. Um, and three teaching modes, because we wanted to give the instructor flexibility on how they wanted to teach. So we do the videos, we have reading, they could read the scripts, take turns in class, or role plays. I am not a lover of role plays, and I kind of fought it, but I've heard from instructors they really like it, so that's good. So here's how we define safety leader. As you can imagine, I mean, there are tons of definitions of leaders and what that means. But the reason we put this one together, we created this one, because it really gets at what we're trying to teach in the FSL. And one of our consultants added that word courage, which has been, I think, really key, because people really need to understand it does take courage to practice the leadership skills in the FSL. It's not doing business as usual. It's making some change. So here are the skills. Leading by example, engaging and empowering your team members or your crew members, actively listening and practicing three-way communication, both real important communication skills, developing your team members through teaching, coaching, and feedback, and recognizing team members for a job well done or for going above and beyond for safety. I mean, a lot of us in our work often don't get recognition for the work we do. We only hear when we do things not quite right. Well, it happens a lot on construction sites. And so recognizing, being able to just say, add a girl, add a boy, whatever, was a really key thing that the curriculum development team told us. And remember, we could only have two and a half hours because we were told by our trainers, any longer than that, and that's even pushing it, we're not going to choose it. So it had to be within a small time period because they got a lot of stuff to fill you know, they got a lot of stuff to do in 30 hours. 
So in order to entice them, it had to be timely and really focused on the goal. Okay, so those are, that's kind of the, some of, a little bit of the foundational material, and I don't have time to go into all the different ways we, in the training of how to practice those five skills. So that's a lot of the foundational material. And in the instructor guide, we provide lots of discussion questions and activities to engage the students in discussion, which we have been told is a really key part of the training. You know, they're not just sitting and listening to uh, how to fix hazards. It's all about discussion and communication, and the, you'll hear a little bit of some of the feedback, but the students really love it, and it's been very exciting. Okay, so this, this is one of the first slides of section two. Remember I told you section one, section two, so now we're getting into the applied. Each of these icons is hyperlinked to get the instructor to the scenario that he or she wants to teach. Can't do all seven in two and a half hours, but we tell them to pick a variety because there's some overlap in the leadership skills, but not all five leadership skills are necessarily covered in each of the scenarios. And then the last icon is um, the takeaway messages. So I'm gonna show you one of the videos, and it's, do we have to? The first slide of each of the scenarios has the same look and feel. Oh, I did wanna tell you before we start. Each of the scenarios is structured the same way in three sections. The first section presents the characters in the scenario with a safety situation, and it varies from heat exhaustion to, um, you'll see this one with checking scaffolding and all sorts of things. So the safety situation changes, the trades change, all on the same construction site, but we wanted to cover a variety of, um, make it interesting and change it up a little bit. So um, then you have outcome A, where the characters are not using the leadership skills. Then you have outcome B, and you see the outcome, how it changes for the better when they do use the leadership skills. So you can see this slide represents the first slide of every uh, scenario. We have the icon that you saw before, the characters who's gonna be, you'll see and meet in the scenario, the three teaching modes for the instructor to choose. Again, these are all hyperlinked to get to the right place. And then a home button so the instructor at the end can click on that and get back to that first slide and go on to the next scenario. Here we go. Floyd, foreman for painting perfection, sees Ed, an experienced painter, along with trainees Tom and Tina, starting to load their materials onto the suspended scaffold. Floyd asks Ed if they've inspected the rigging on the roof to make sure the scaffold is secure. Ed snaps back, saying they checked it this morning and were only gone 45 minutes. Tom chimes in, saying he's sure the rigging is fine, adding that it's probably 120 degrees on the roof. So that's the situation. Got Floyd and how he responds. He now has to figure out what to do next. Floyd shrugs, saying one check in the morning is probably okay. Ed tells Tom and Tina to hurry and finish loading the materials so maybe they can knock off a little early. They finish loading the scaffold with enough supplies so they won't have to come down and get more. But at four feet off the ground, one of the riggings on the roof gives way, causing the scaffold to tip, taking them and their materials with it. Fortunately, no one is hurt, but it will cost the company both time and money, making Floyd and the owner very unhappy. I love that guy hanging from the, I don't know. The videographer is just, he was amazing. Okay, outcome B. Tom and Ed's reaction makes Floyd wonder if they actually know how to inspect rigging and make needed corrections. Or worse, maybe they think it's okay to cut corners. 
He tells them that even though it's hot on the roof, the scaffold rigging is what's keeping them from falling, and it must be checked. Ed groans when Floyd tells them to get Tom and Tina so all of them can go up to the roof. On the roof, Floyd asks them to check the rigging. After a minute or so, Ed admits that they're not 100% sure what to look for because they've always trusted others to check. Rather than being mad, Floyd thanks him for being honest. He then carefully goes over all the OSHA rules and manufacturer's recommendations for securing a suspended scaffold. When he's done, he asks them to take turns repeating the rules and demonstrating how to inspect the rigging. As they leave the roof, Floyd tells them again how much he appreciates their good work and for not pretending to know how to do something, particularly when it could have such serious safety consequences. Then Tina surprises Floyd when she thanks him for recognizing their value as team members and for saying so. So I like showing that one because, um, first of all, the guy hanging from the harness, that's pretty cool. But uh, active listening in scenario in the situation or the outcome A, Floyd wasn't actively listening. And we talk about actively listening, not just not just hearing, I mean, that's a big piece of it is listening to hear versus listening to come up with a response, which I know we're all uh, guilty of at times, uh, but also paying attention to the nonverbal cues. So when, and he recognizes them at the end and he develops and teaches them and makes them do it. So this one captures a lot of the skills. Uh, but in between each of the sections, we have questions for the instructor to ask the students to engage them in discussion about how Floyd did it, what could he have done better, things like that. So it allows them to apply the information they learned in section one through these scenarios. And also, I mean, what I've been in classes, it's like, oh yeah, that happens all the time, you know, and stuff like that. So it's a lot of experiential uh, familiarity. Uh, so it, it's pretty cool to watch it. So that's just an example, and you saw on that scenario slide, um, or the first slide of section two, we also have takeaways that kind of end the, uh, we want people to take away after they've participated in the course. It takes courage to be a leader. It takes courage to speak up. This is a key. These skills can be inserted into your daily routines. They don't take a lot of time. This is what leaders, safety leaders do, and safety leaders improve safety climate and safety outcomes. So um, these are the takeaways that we have. And just to give you a sense of the teaching materials, again, my goal was to put this together and hand it to people as a complete product that they could just use and not you know, have to, they could come up with other things that they want to, but I wanted to make it fully usable from day one. So we have our primary teaching materials. We have a PowerPoint for PC and Mac. We have a really detailed instruction guide and time management and questions and activities and all sorts of things. And then a, a student handout as well. We've also created some supplemental materials to kind of go with it, including a hardhead sticker and pocket reference card an FAQ document. We've just recently finished actually six toolbox talks because I split up actively listening and practicing three-way three communication into two. We have a handbook with a personal action plan that leaders can use. And then a train the, train pre train the trainer presentation because the way uh, OSHA is instructed or the Department of Training and Education, they have 500 level courses who teach the OSHA 30 instructors to become OSHA 30 instructors. And they don't want to give the to whole two and a half hour FSL, they want to be able to introduce it to people. So we created a train the trainer um, product. Before I uh, share that preliminary evaluation data that I told you about, I'm happy to report that many large companies, I mean Southern Company, Dimio Construction, Lots of large and small companies, Safeway, uh, scaffolding, have already been training their foremen on the FSL. 
and a number of trades unions have incorporated it into their F um, foreman training. And the key thing that I told you about, our key goal was to get OSHA to include it in the OSHA 30 hour. January 1st, this past year, they did. Now it's an elective, it's not required yet, but there is some rumblings about that. Um, so in less than a year since its official launch via OSHA and otherwise on our website, thousands of workers have already been trained on the FSL. And we're really excited about that. And the feedback so far has been great. And here are just a few examples. So having the crew more willing to bring up items to the foreman and made changes on site and brought it to the attention of people, so leading up right, to people who can make changes more upstream. A successful training that benefited not only the foreman and the superintendent or, and stewards, but the overall safety climate. I mean, that's huge. I mean, that was our initial hypothesis. Now, that's an N of one, but, you know, but we're evaluating the data on that. And this is a, a fellow named Tony O'Day who worked for Zurich, who works for Zurich now, but he was 25 year, years at Gilbane. Uh, construction, and he was at the workshop way back, whoops, way back in 2013, and he's a big promoter on, of it with his clients, so that's really exciting to hear. So as I said, preliminary, preliminary data, literally just finished collecting the data in September, just analyzing now. So this is just the leader data. I mean, we are also collecting surveys with their crew to see if they perceive a difference in the leadership activities and practices of their foreman and also in safety climate on the job site. So we can see here that from pre-training to immediate post-training, obviously there's an increase, little dip at two weeks out, little increase at four weeks out, but even at two and four, we're still higher than we were at pre-training. So, you know, it trying to do a experimental research out in the field and you know do this is always challenging but these are really promising findings but this is not the whole data set or anything i just wanted to get some data up here to show you since it is a research talk right <laughs> anyway here are all the urls for you to use to um, be geniuses and Go on the website, explore CPWR, take the SCAT. If you decide you want your company to uh, take the SCAT as a group, you'll read the instructions on the SCAT website and give me a call or send me an email and we can set up a specific code for you to use, run a report, and uh, work with you on that. So it's been truly an honor to be here. Uh, I really hope that you're able to use this information in your own work. and. Keep doing the great work you're doing to keep Canadian workers safe and healthy. Thank you.